is a professor in the Department of Forest Ecosystems Society who works on trophic cascades and wolf ungulate aspen ecology in Yellowstone National Park and many other ecosystems. From this work, he has been one of the principal ecologists to elucidate what has been called the ecology of fear. Okay, um, I'm going to talk to you about uh, a similar topic, is, but we're going to look at predators and prey, and uh, especially the ecology of fear and related uh, themes. I want to acknowledge my co-author, um, Bob Beshta. So since I'm the last presenter, um, it's time for a little quiz. <laughs> so um, who can tell me what this is? Any, you can guess. A whale tooth? A whale tooth, that's pretty good. Something else? What? Is it a claw? No, it's not a claw. T-Rex, too. No, it's not T-Rex. So, um, yes, so who said that? So this is a saber tooth from the species Smilodon. It's a replica that got put at the uh, targets. So this is a very fierce predator that lived 15,000 years ago in North America. And um, I was just thinking about um, Kathy's mention of King of the Universe. Let's just say humans didn't make it to North America. They never made it out of Africa, Homo sapiens. Um, what would have been the King of the Universe here um, for uh, biotic interactions in North America? So uh, this is uh, a skull from the uh, Tar Pits Museum of the Smilodon. It's the biggest cat that ever, uh, or that uh, lived during the Pleistocene era uh, in North America. It's now extinct. But let's think about um, these forces in nature. So I, I argue that predation is a, one of the strongest forces in nature in helping drive evolution. So here you can see the interactions of some of these uh, individuals, the dire wolf on the lower right, um, challenging the Smilodon for the prey, and the scavengers, uh, we've been talking about them a little bit, they're up above, and then there's the family uh, unit uh, looking on, waiting for a turn to eat, so there's all kinds of dynamics going on with this um, culture of predators of prey. So now let's fast forward to uh, some of the um, activities I've been involved with recently. I've been looking at, um, with Bob, uh, the effects of predators on ecosystems in these uh, national parks, Wind Cave, Yellowstone, Jasper, Olympic, Yosemite, and Zion. We got started in um, Yellowstone. Uh, the federal government uh, extirpated all the wolves in Yellowstone by 1926. Now we, we have, had gone 70 years without wolves in this national park, and then in 1995 uh, they, the government brought them back in and released the wolves into Yellowstone, and what did they do? They started uh, preying on their favorite species, which is elk. So um, another little pop quiz, how long does it take the ravens to arrive at the wolf kill? Seconds. <laughs> <laughs> So, it, yeah, it's, it's between 20 and 40 seconds. There's been a study on this. Okay, one final quiz here for this part of the show. So, which one is smarter, the wolf, the elk, or the raven? Okay, yes. so uh, uh, if you want to vote, uh, let's see hands for the wolf. Okay, and the elk. And the raven. Okay, the raven. Wow, this is a... Really, uh, so um, the story with the raven is that um, they follow the wolves around somewhat and they're keeping an eye on when the kill gets made. So they're quite smart, it's a corvid and we're learning all about uh, how smart these birds are, extremely, really intelligent. And so then they will, uh, as soon as the kill is made, they will um, be there to scavenge. But so I was thinking about that um, a number of years ago, and I thought, wow, I wonder if the ravens do anything else. I wonder, uh, 
So I, I was just thinking, well, maybe the ravens uh, know what's going to happen, so they will circle high above where elk might be hanging out, and maybe they could be thinking, well, we'll, we'll show the, the wolves where the elk are, where the prey are. So I tried it once in Grand Teton Park where there were wolves, and I saw the ravens, and there's this big, long hill. And I said, okay, there should be elk right on their side of that hill. So hike, 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 hike up the hill, and uh, got to the top and looked, and there was this huge herd of elk right over the other side. Now, that's a sample of one, so uh, I won't <laughs> say that that's always the case. But if it is the case, uh, the ravens are thinking several steps ahead. They're thinking what the, uh, what the behavior of the wolves might be, and they're maybe assisting. I won't put it past them that they have this all played out. Um, and um, I'm really impressed with these hands on the raven here. <laughs> so uh, with these wolves back into Yellowstone, we're looking at their effects on uh, the ecosystem. And these are uh, happen in two ways. One, through mortality of their prey. And the second way is changing the behavior of their prey. And uh, that was especially important um, during the, um, the first years after wolves arrived. So here um, we can see that um, with the, these wolves back, the uh, resurgence of willow by 2001. So this is what's called a trophic cascade, and most of you have heard about that story. Then by 2010, take a look. 97 to 2010, go back to 2001. So things are getting better in some places in Yellowstone where plants can now flourish where they were being uh, munched too much before the wolves were there. So this is that cascading interaction uh, that um, we're somewhat familiar with now. Now we think that the wolves affect many different uh, uh, portions of the food web. Um, so um, I recently had the opportunity to uh, work with Aaron Wersing at the University of Washington. And we asked the question, well, uh, do the prey of wolves have similar behavior to the prey of tiger sharks? So we looked at dugans in uh, Shark Bay. Well, I think we heard about Shark Bay last night from Virginia. And so these dugans are the prey of the tiger sharks and the elk. And what we, uh, and what we found was there were and there are similarities in terms of the uh, encounter avoidance and escape uh, facilitation and the level of vigilance when the predators in the area. So that was kind of interesting that um, uh, these two very different species have very similar uh, behavior. And, and this behavior we think is, is based on the ecology of fear or behavioral changes uh, in the presence of their predator. Okay, let's go down to uh, Zion National Park. We uh, studied the cougar deer system down in Zion, and we, uh, we had two study sites, one at North Creek, which is a uh, roadless wilderness area, uh, and you can see the uh, North Creek uh, down on the bottom where those cottonwoods are in fall colors. Uh, very few people get here. This is a, um, quite a hike down the canyon. Uh, cougar are common here uh, at this site. Then you can go over to Zion Canyon, and this canyon gets 2.6 million human visitors per year. And so many that the, uh, when the visitor numbers came up by the 1940s, the uh, cougar got scared out of the canyon. So um, then the deer came into the canyon because that's a safe place to hang out, and they, they're smart enough to know there are very few predators around, and then they ate themselves out of house and home, which is shown in here where they're very little understory in the, um, along the river there. So the scientists call this uh, process optimal foraging theory, or I can call it human shielding, where the deer would sooner go hungry in a safe place than take the risk of being preyed upon by a cougar. So um, this is over, this picture I took in Zion Canyon, and this deer was only like from me to you, and uh, there was very little food. They liked to browse on um, broadleaf plants and shrubs and young trees. There was just some grass and very little uh, nutrition there for the deer. And you can see what kind of shape it is in. When I uh, hiked down into North Creek, where the cougar were common, I got a few fleeting glimpses of the very fast deer there. 
And it's a completely different uh, behavior. And the condition of the animals uh, were really uh, very different. So could the thoughts and feelings of animals affect biodiversity? So we decided to do some uh, visual encounter surveys of different uh, species. We looked at the, uh, in, in this, we compared the areas uh, with high cougar, cougar are common versus cougar are scarce in those two canyons next to each other. We looked at the uh, cardinal flowers and the asters on these uh, visual encounter surveys along the streams. We looked at the canyon tree frogs, and these are kind of cool because they have these little suction cup uh, feet that hang up, hang on the rocks. And uh, we studied the lizards and enumerated those on our visual encounter surveys. And the butterflies, we looked at abundance and diversity of these species. And what we found was where cougars are common, wildflowers, amphibians, lizards, and butterflies were much more abundant. Uh, both in, the, in their counts and the number of species. So uh, uh, my answer would be, yes, it is possible that the thoughts and feelings of these prey could affect biodiversity. Well, then could the thoughts and feelings of the animals change the shape of a river? Well, that's really a stretch, uh, you might say. But if you look at... Um, the, uh, this is a cougar common east fork of the Virgin River uh, where if the predators are keeping the, um, the prey in check, they don't eat all the, um, the woody vegetation along the banks and they, we get these um, deep um, narrow channels um, with lush vegetation of willows and cottonwood along the sides. But if you go back in Design Canyon, we have uh, uh, the stream bank vegetation has been um, browsed down, uh, lending itself to more erosion, and then we get these uh, wider channels and uh, downcutting and erosion. So um, I would conclude that it is possible for the thoughts and feelings of the animals that want to play, play it safe there next to the humans to affect the shape of rivers. These are just some charts showing how the, the shapes of the rivers are different in the two areas in terms of eroding banks and the width-depth ratio of the streams. <coughs> so, um, in summary then, this would be the cougar common landscape, and on the right would be the cougar rare. And uh, that's Bob and myself over there. <laughs> 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 right. Uh, so, uh, and we even have data on fish, uh, find uh, that the fish surveys show that uh, where the cougar is common, there's more uh, fish that were uh, counted on the surveys. So we decided to go over to Yosemite National Park. It's also a beautiful canyon like Zion. And you can see these beautiful waterfalls up. Um, I think that's the two falls, Yosemite Falls. But if you let your eye lower down here on the, uh, these huge um, California black oaks, we studied um, the recruitment of those oak trees. And uh, the hypothesis is uh, uh, a ecology of fear thing that um, near the visitor center in Yosemite Valley, there will be more deer because it's safer and the deer will be uh, using this thing called uh, human shielding. So here, uh, as I was doing the research, I saw this young woman walking down a path by the visitor center. Right next to her was this deer. And they were both walking along, and neither one of them was paying attention to each other, and they were only like three feet apart. And that was very interesting. So uh, deer are very smart. Now, they, if, this were, if there was hunting in this, in this canyon, these deer would not be nearby. So uh, human shields. So they, uh, so you know, the humans usually put themselves on top in terms of intelligence, but they, I think it's just a matter of how much we don't know about the other species that's the limiting factor. For example, the mule deer uh, here next to the visitor center, they, um, they're eating the uh, acorns and the, uh, the young oak seedlings. So that's why we don't have any recruitment and regeneration of the oaks right by the visitor center. Um, these deer know uh, they know which acorns are rotten and which ones aren't just by their scent. So they don't waste any time in which ones to, um, to forage on. So um, 
up on the coast range, we can move into Oregon here. This is a, um, over there by Cape Perpetua, right in the central Oregon coast range. This is an area where there are um, elk without their native predator, the wolf. And in this site, they have uh, eaten the understory, browsed down the understory like the berry producing shrubs and the young hemlock. You can see how it's so open there. Um, and you can go look here, and not far away, uh, we have this lush understory. What's the difference in these two areas? Does anyone have any idea? Well, uh, without having any wolves in the system, this area here uh, is back in the wilderness. It's away from the road. This is closer to the gravel road, and this, this area is hunted. So, um, again, according to the ecology of fear idea that the prey um, and the, the humans are the predators, the prey will um, avoid where the predators go. It's pretty simple. But it's interesting to see how these effects ripple through the landscape. <laughs> um, so, um, we've heard about uh, companionship last night when Virginia was talking uh, about the, uh, the individual animals how social they are in their culture. But what I want to leave you with is some breaking news on um, new research, uh, research um, on companionship between species. So um, you're the first to see this. This is <laughs> Now, uh, this hopscotch thing is, uh, is just really being looked at for the first time. And, uh, but you know, seriously, we think that wolves may help sheep because coyotes take a lot more sheep than wolves, and wolves control coyotes. So there might be something to this if uh, coyote predation on sheep might go down where wolves are abundant. So um, I think I'll just leave you with that thought. But before I, I quit, um, this um, is really not a real picture. <laughs> okay, that's all. <laughs>